Okay, so welcome one and all, and I'm going to start us off. So bear with me uh, with karakia this morning. And I am going to start with uh, the one that I can't find on our papers, but I will open with karakia this morning. Um, he honore he korori ki te atu he maunga rongo ki te fenua he fakaro pai ki ngā tangata katoa hanga e te atu he ngā koho ki roto ki te nā ki te nā o mato fakatonga to wairu a tapu he afina he manaki a mato i roto i te mahi o te nei rā amene and uh, welcome welcome Janine and I don't think we have any other members of the of the public. With us, Margaret, I'll just check with you. Okay. Right, we've got Janine yes. Rankin. And I've got a couple of people in the waiting room I'm not sure of. We've got a Wendy Ann Harvard and a Shirley Carmichael, but I don't know. The Wendy is our board member from the from the Wairapa. Oh, so that's Norman. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought he was an apology. Right, I will admit him. Good morning, Norman. You could always admit the other person and see who, see who they are. Oh, they've gone now. Okay. And are we waiting for anyone else? I do have... Um, an apology, obviously, from mm, we've, Brendan. We've just got Lou joining now. Okay. Can you hear and from Vaughan? No, I think he's the only one that's... Oh, I wonder if... Them. He wouldn't be under the name of Shirley and Carmichael, would he? Oh, he might be, actually. That's, might be. Oh, that person's gone. Oh. But I'm sure he'll join again. Okay. Well, you'll let us know. No. Uh, Margaret, as we as yep. we go along, so we'll just right. Vaughan's we'll now come on here. I wonder if that was him. Um... Oh, cool. Brilliant. Good morning, Vaughan. It was real difficult getting on today. Good morning, Lou. Yeah, I was just saying, mine mine's uh, a little connection is a little bit. Tenuous, but um, we'll just see how we get on. I just couldn't get in. Right, we're all here now. I also have um, so Matiro has is is here with us at the moment, but she will be um, leaving at some stage. But Margaret, you'll be able to keep an eye on that, and then re be joining us uh, a little bit later on. So there'll be um, an apology during the the meeting as well. Has anyone got any late items they'd like to bring to the today's table? We've got pretty full agenda and, and um, we'll need to move things along a bit, but um, it doesn't seem to be. And if people um, use a little, little um, reaction button in terms of wanting to ask a question rather than raising your own hand, I think I'll be able to see that better. Um, apart from Heather, who will have to just keep an eye on the chat for you, Heather, in terms of... Uh, I th can you hear me now? Yes, are you on your iPhone uh, or...? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, brilliant. Thank you, sorry. Is there but anyone that has a conflict with any of the items on today's meeting? Thank you. And if anyone has got any uh, new interests or changed interests, if you could please let Margaret know at the earliest. Right, let's move on to the minutes of the 17th of August, 2021 board meeting. Could I have a mover for those minutes, please? Happy to move, Chair, Vaughan Dennison. Kia ora Vaughan, and a seconder. Kia ora Jenny. All those in favour, raise your hand. Is there any matters arising from those minutes that anyone would like to bring up? Oh, brilliant. Okay. 
So a verbal report from the board chair, as I, as I said, um, Brendan has put his apology in. Just to, um, there was a couple of matters. You would have seen that Brendan um, and myself as chair of Mana Whenua Hauwara did a press release congratulating Dr. Um, Curtis Walker on his appointment to the New Zealand Health Authority. And we also, um, I want to acknowledge Awerangi Tamihire, uh, who is Tangata Whenua from our, from our rohe for her appointment to the Māori Health Authority as, as well. And Brendan hasn't given me uh, anything else except to say that they are still meeting regularly as, uh, as chairs. And he also acknowledged the appointment to the New Zealand Health Authority of the three board, current board, three of the current board chairs as well. John, I'm going to pass to you for a verbal if you have anything from HEDEC. Kia ora koutou, uh, na, na mihi ori ana, and um, yes, um, congratulations to those appointed, especially our orangi. Um, from um, HTEC, um, well, our, our meeting was um, a very full one, and uh, like yours, a Zoom, and um, proved challenging to chair. Um, a bigger screen is always an asset, I think, for a chair mm. in circumstances like these. However, just a few things to note. Um, our, our regional service integration update included um, um, uh, progress um, with the IT integration led by uh, Bryce O'Kane and Steve Miller. Uh, but we're still having challenges uh, recruiting SMOs. Mm. Um, in terms of the child development referral integration project, um, we're expecting a pilot in October for, and this is for children um, requiring specialist care. To Adato, um, it was noted that there's a lack of supportive structures for the discharge of intellectually disabled into patients into the community. And it's proposed that this be addressed by an MDT. And to Uru Kiri Ora, um, just a, a, a big, um, as Ashley would say, ups to them, um, uh, rolling out their bespoke uh, COVID vaccination program to reach out to this disabled community. Look, um, I think the thing that I think we probably need to, do, to, to develop with HDAC and, and whatever succeeds it is, we need to be looking more at disability. It's very rarely mentioned. And look, um, I've spoken of these simply because they have the, uh, they are really the um, a few times we've actually uh, reached into the disabled community. Uh, kia ora koutou. Oh, tēnā koe, John. Thank you for that. I want to uh, note the unconfirmed part one minutes of the Health and Disability Advisory Committee meeting held on 14th December 2021. And I'm going to take it, John, that you'll move those and I'll need a seconder. Kia ora, Heather. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Carried. Uh, we're up to 2.8, the frank, the verbal report from the committee chair. I've checked in with Tony. There is nothing extra that he would like to add uh, to that meeting in terms of a report to the board. And so I want to note the unconfirmed part one minutes of the finance risk and audit committee meeting held on the 7th of September, 2021. And I'm looking for a mover. Thank you, Vaughan, and a seconder. Kia ora, Muriel. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Kia ora. And we're on to 2.9 Mana Whenua Ho Order Chairs report, which I put my other hat on. One moment and I shall scroll. So I, are you okay if I hand to you, Tracy, if there's anything? Sure. I'm taking the reporters as read, but from um, your perspective, obviously we want to add our congratulations to, to the appointments for um, the Māori Health Authority. It's really a very exciting it, it's generated a lot of conversation in terms of of the appointments and i particularly want to note apart from awirangi uh the appointment of lady uh Tureti mopson in terms of the role that she's played in bringing uh the the claim to to the treaty of waitangi and her continued role in advocating for 
Poho water and the well-being of Māori generally across our across our country. So with that, I'll hand to you, Tracy, if you've got any any comments you'd like to make. Uh koe, Chair. Um, kia ora koutou, uh, ngā manutou. Um, uh, nothing to add other than to say that uh, in the report we spoke a bit about the workforce plan and I just want to let the board know that that was endorsed by both Mana Whenua Hauora and OLT yesterday. Uh, so we'll be steaming ahead with uh, uh, the pipeline development for the Māori workforce across DHB and um, in the um, uh, community sector. I'll turn up Tracy. I want to uh, note the report from the Mana Whenua Hauora Chair on the Mana Whenua Hauora Hui held August 2021 and note the General Manager Māori House response to the Chair's report. I'll move that and uh, second, kia ora John. All those in favour? Ngā mihi. And our strategic focus is, is moved to, to part two and we're up to performance reporting and I'm going to hand to you, Kath. Tēnā koe. Our chief executive. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, not entirely in this report, but um, there is a small section in my report on the acute mental health unit. And um, last night I was really pleased to receive an email um, from the Ministry of Health uh, Infrastructure Unit who um, said that um, they were extremely pleased with our model of care that underpins the business case, um, which we've just refreshed, if you'll recall, and that they had um, said to Minister Little and um, also the Deputy Prime Minister, who they were meeting with, that um, that it would be used, that should be used as an exemplar across all DHBs who are doing um, these um, kinds of developments. So it's really nice to get that kind of positive feedback from the ministry. That doesn't happen that often, so I want to kind of celebrate it when it does. And not that we don't do great work, but you know, um, you know, we don't often get them reaching out and really giving us that kind of um, accolade. So well done to Scott, um, Vanessa, of course, who's not with us, and the broader mental health team. Um, excuse me <coughs> for that. Oh, excuse me for that hard work. Oh, sorry, that sneeze is not very well timed. Um, um, aside from that, um, you know, there's a sort of a, a quite a lot in this report, so it might be um, um, better if I um, ask um, for any questions or if any comments. Questions for Kess? In the meantime, Kess, I just want to endorse that, that, those congratulations, that, that is a, um, in terms of the model of care and putting it up as an exemplar for the rest of the country is, yeah, is certainly worthy of note. So uh, just to endorse your, your thanks to the team, particularly to Scott and, and Vanessa. And hopefully Vanessa will receive that message in her new life um, from, yes. from you. Uh, I'll pass that on over brunch. <laughs> Brilliant. Kia ora, Jenny. Kia ora. Um, Kath, I just thank you for your um, detailed report and for the presentation that you shared with us. Um, and my question is just relates to that presentation and the very bottom, page 81, under future projections and capacity, um, under key points in the green box, the very last statement um, has, or point, has the PCI capacity required in the region is expected to grow slightly, but not sufficient enough to warrant significant growth in the development of PCI cath labs. And I was just um, wondering wondering if um, that just made me think about the work we're doing in the cath lab that, that we're going to be put in. So it could just be my medical ignorance, but I just wondered if you could speak to that point for me, please. Yes, so the um, uh, board will recall that we have as part of SPIRE a signed off business case for the establishment of our cath lab, which will include um, PCI. Um, it's been a bit of a challenging time over recent months. That might be an understatement. Um, but it has been challenging in the regional context um, as um, Hawke's Bay had aspirations to also establish a PCI-enabled cath lab um, and Capital and Coastal tertiary provider 
um, had concerns around the development of two additional cath labs, um, if not one, and um, the models of care around that. So that's been discussed quite regularly at our chief executive meeting and with the chairs at RGG. Um, just in fact, only as late as last week, I understand Hawke's Bay have been told that they will not be supported to proceed with a PCI-enabled cath lab. Um, we have an improved business case, so I had a conversation with the lead CEO last week, um, and that's really around the relationship between ourselves and Capital Coast, and I've received an email to um, support that, which is really about how we organise the cardiac services um, uh, jointly with um, Capital Coast supporting our recruitment of interventional cardiologists um, and how we work together. I think that there's still a piece of work to come around what a contemporary cardiology service or cardiac service looks like for our region. And that will be done by the end of the year. Um, but suffice to say, it would appear um, that we've moved into a phase of people not um, wondering why we're having one, but now starting to think about how do we ensure that the that um, Mid-Central is supported to have a very effective um, cath lab. Um, I mean, if you look at the data that was in that report, it's got some pretty grim um, outcomes for people that live in our populations in the central region, some of the worst outcomes, you know, um, and there's a real equity concern for Māori, Pacifica and other vulnerable populations around access in a timely way um, to, um, you know, I guess, interventional cardiology. So I feel pretty, I feel like we've turned a corner only just this last week, actually, um, and I'm pretty happy. And there's been quite a lot of advocacy and um, going on with Andrew Connolly and others to help us to get to this place. Um, so onwards and upwards. So can I just further to Jenny's question, Kes? So, and I'm reading 146, page 146, and it talks about there's not um, the PCI capacity required in the in the region is expected to grow slightly, but not sufficient enough to warrant a significant growth in the development of PCI cath labs. So I'm happy to hear um, you say about the, the pretty grim uh, stats for Māori and, and, and Pacifica. So I was a little bit concerned that what does that mean for us, but we're still on track, I'm, I'm happy to hear. And I also wondered how much of an input uh, TAS now has Marama Parore on board as their, their Māori uh, health director, if you like, and um, making sure that she's at the table advocating mm -hmm. to make sure that we don't lose any ground. So thank you for that. Are there yeah. any other questions for Kath? No, there are not. Well, thank you for your report, Kath. And I'd like to note the update of key local, regional and national matters. And could I have a mover for that, please? Kia ora, John, and kia ora, Karen. All in favour, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. And have we got Kelly on board? Oh, there you are, Kelly. Morena, how are you? It's over to you, the board uh, KPI dashboard. Uh, Kelly, you're muted. Me, Kelly. That would be helpful then, would it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll start. Sorry. Um, so reporting on the new indicator starts next quarter. And um, so they will be incorporated then into the KPI dashboard. We are still waiting on a couple of those indicators and details to come through from the ministry yet, though. Um, as you'll see, the graphs have been extended to show multiple years. Um, and because this is the start of a new year um, for July, you'll just see a little dot rather than, than a line. So um, hopefully that's, that's not too confusing for you. Um, and then in regards to primary and community, you'll see there's still a really strong and priority focus in regards to immunization. Um, and obviously, uh, noting that the ED remains a challenging area, but there are multiple plans in place um, to try and improve that. Happy if there's any questions. 
Questions, questions for Kerry? No, everyone's quite happy. Thank you for your Excellent. report. Leah. Fabulous. We shall see you soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks. And we're now handing over to Neil and Daryl in terms of the financial update. And it's for July and August. So we'll do the August and then the July one. Uh, we'll take it. Can we just have a mover and seconder for oh, the sorry. API? Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Muriel. And a seconder. Thank you, Vaughan. Yep. Oh, sorry. No, that was Norman. Now we'll hand over to Neil and Daryl. Good morning, Ariana, and thank you very Good much. Um, I'll just touch base on a couple of things and then Daryl will, will um, stick through the paper. When looking at the August result, indeed the July result for that matter, there's a, um, it's worth being mindful still that this is on the provisional um, budgeting basis, so the budget variances are not as meaningful as they would normally be. Um, that will, of course, um, correct when we get September's results out with a, a improved budget. Probably the, when I look at it, the two things that stand out for me in the, the result for August is that the first is that the planned care revenue is significantly affected as was IDF by the um, COVID impact, shutting down our capacity. That costs us a little over $700,000 and it's pretty much um, explains why we were um, off the track we are. The rest is, um, there's quite a lot of um, noise kicking around in there. But the other thing which was quite um, remarkable, I thought was the, um, we are tracking at the um, on the, the lower end of the path we need to be on with the, in terms of our FTE. And that's, uh, while it's undesirable not to have the people on board we need, financially, where that's actually leading to, of course, is a, a quite constrained impact on the PML. Um, and with those preliminary comments, let me pass to Daryl to step you through it. Um, so th thanks, Neil. So stole my thunder, really. Um, the story of, of, of August is um, is around plan care and us not being able to achieve our targets given, um, you know, the, uh, the 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 lockdown and the difficulty um, in operating in that that environment. Um, it is early days, and so um, we you'll see in there there's a comment about uh, a proposed uh, budget changes, which is in part two, I believe. Um, and so we are looking to sort of redress some of the some of the phasing issues that we've sort of come across in the first two months. Um, FTEs are extremely favourable at the moment, um, a lot to do with um, nursing. Of course, we uh, put in the budget uh, a number of CCDM positions, which uh, we are going, we, we haven't filled, certainly haven't filled, and it will take some time to fill, which again is being addressed um, through some of the proposed budget changes. Um, overall, um, it, as I say, early days, um, the, the results are um, favourable to budget on a year-to-date basis, uh, 577 against a budget of, uh, so a surplus against a, a budget of 1.39 million, um, so 800,000 adverse to date. Happy to take questions on August. Um, Thank you, Neil and Daryl. Are there questions? We might have to have Zoom meetings more often. This is fantastic. So if there are no questions for for either Neil or Daryl, I want to I'll move from the chair that we note that the month operating result for August 2021 is a surplus before one-off items of 0 0.542 million, which is 0.798 million adverse to budget. Note that the year-to-date operating result for August 2021 is a surplus before one-off items of 1.420 million, which is 1.140 million adverse to budget. Note the year-to-date for August 2021 COVID-19-related contribution of 0.149 million and holidays at costs of 0.922 have been incurred. Including these results in a year to date deficit after exceptional items of 0.577 million, which is 0.186 million adverse to budget. Note that the total available cash and equivalents of 38.777 million is at 31st of August 2021 is sufficient to support liquidity requirements. Note that this is an interim finance report and that a full report will come, up, come to the board for consideration at its November meeting. Can I have a seconder, please? 
Kia ora, Karen. All those in favour? Is there anything in the July report that that's that we need to talk about? Because I'll I'll move those in the same. If not, um, probably not. I mean, just in terms of the uh, variances, I think the graph on. Um on page 170 is, is telling in that um, we did have uh, a favourable uh, staffing costs, but offset by adverse outsourced staffing, particularly around the obviously the medical staff, which was uh, quite significant um, in that month. But it kind of reverses slightly in the in, in August. Well, noting noting those figures, if you're happy with that, with that, Karen, for you and I to to move and second the July report as well for 2021. And all those in favour? Uh, thank you very much, Neil and Daryl. And we're over to you, Judith. Morena. Morena, kia ora, kia ora koutou. Um, thank you for um, receiving the Sustainability Plan report. Um, it has been endorsed by FRAC. Just a couple of highlights I thought you might want to be aware of as the board. Um, we have made some significant progress in the last month um, in the um, achievement of two business cases that are connected to the sustainability plan and are in your part two papers. Um, we've also launched or are launching the wellbeing tool within the um, culture and wellbeing program associated with the, with the um, sustainability plan. And we're also making plans to um, implement the OPPO Community Service. Um, I'd just like to draw your attention to the um, framework, which is at the end of the um, report and um, outlines how we will um, look at the benefits coming from the sustainability plan. This has been endorsed by FRAC. Um, it's based on our clinical governance framework and also the um, healthcare improvement quadruple aim um, domains. Um, and we will be presenting a dashboard that you will be able to review in future meetings associated with um, the improvements that the plan should deliver. Um, and apart from that, I don't have anything else particularly to say other than um, to take any questions. Questions for Judith? I just want to make a comment, Judith, that that, um, that it, in terms of the, the framework at the end, it seems that everything is coming together really nicely in terms of being able to see very clearly where we're at in terms of the sustainability plan. So thank you for that. Thank you. And apart from that, I don't see anyone raising their hand. So. I'd like us to note that the Finance Risk and Audit Committee endorsed this report at its September meeting for the board's consideration. Note the progress in the implementation of the sustainability plan. Approve the sustainability plan benefits framework. Approve the approach and progress made to date on the sustainability plan 2020 through to 2023. Could I have a mover, please? Thank you, Muriel, and a seconder. Thank you, John. All those in favour? Thank you very much, Judith. Thanks, I'll be back later. Yes, we will see you. Like the Terminator, you'll be back. And we are now up to... So, kia ora, Chick, and... We just long, is it? I'm just flicking. It's uh, Steve, sorry for the um, oh, sorry, update. Sorry, Steve. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. So what am I, I, sorry, Steve, welcome. Morena, everybody. Um, okay, I will kick into it then. Um, so another update on um, the Digital Services Work Program. Good progress since the last reporting period. Um, you'll note that at the back, in terms of the clinical business priorities and the B business as usual initiatives in digital, there's been you know solid progress since um, the last reporting. Um, Please note also that um, we've completed the exchange online migration for the whole organisation. That's a big piece of work. 
Um, it has really helped us improve our cyber posture. And um, if you're seeing what's happening in the press out there at the moment, um, that, that threat just continues to increase. And um, our cyber awareness training has been well accepted by our staff and is um, really turning up results um, in terms of uh, them recognizing um, phishing attacks and reporting them proactively and not clicking on inappropriate emails, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's pleasing to note. Um, lastly, I'll just draw your attention to the regional and national activity that's going on. Um, it's ramping up, obviously, as part of the sector reform. Um, strong regional collaboration occurring with my colleagues um, in terms of just trying to get aligned uh, or continue and continuing the collaboration to cross pollinate and share activities. Um, importantly, in the national side of things, um, the transition unit day one planning is really starting to ramp up and it's consuming a, quite a bit of time from a number of us uh, to be involved in that process. Um, and lastly, just drawing your attention to the cabinet paper that's going up uh, via Minister Little um, soon to draw down some additional funding out of the 400 million um, data and digital bid for 21-22. Um, whilst most of that is going to be focused on the HURA platform, the national initiative around supporting data interoperability, there is a little bit of funding looming in terms of helping DHBs in the sector uplift their digital maturity. Um, I'm still unclear exactly what that number is, but um, and no doubt a lot of people will be crawling over trying to get access to a bit of it, um, but at least we're getting something. And uh, finally, there's just a, a third item there around um, funding to get uh, assist the sector again continue to invest appropriately to manage our cyber risk. Um, so I'll open it up to the floor in terms of, well, no, it's not really a floor, the virtual floor, if there's any questions. Thank you, Steve. Anyone, can I just ask a question, Steve, in terms of, um, you spoke about the staff responsiveness to to, um, to the program around, around awareness and, and cyber attacks. So that, that would obviously be a part of a, a compulsory part of the orientation program for anyone joining the organisation? It's definitely part of the induction process, yes. And um, we continue about every six weeks to push out additional training and awareness. We're just communicating, communicating, communicating. People have, as I said, um, been going online and doing the training. Um, and as I said, we've actually seen an increase in reported incidents out there. With Exchange Online, we are able to intervene too. So as soon as we get uh, awareness of something, we can proactively reach out to everyone's email boxes and delete the inappropriate emails. Oh, we're, Whereas before we couldn't. So there's a whole range of benefits and additional um, capability we have now that we're on what's called Exchange Online. Yeah. Is there any questions, comments from anyone else? Oh, the other thing I'm thinking about, Steve, is as we get more connected and 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 there are other providers that don't necessarily come into the DHB system, but whether we as as a providership across the sector, um, you know, are up to date as well. And I know, obviously, you think Hawara and other big organisations will be, but there's going to be some that um, will have very little idea about yeah. this, and it may be the weak link in our in our you know, system across yeah. the board. Yeah, agreed. I, I think the the national funding and stock take um, is quite important to further assess that. Um, we have some tool sets that we invested in here at Mid Central that gives us a bit of a view of external parties. Um, but uh, clearly, you know, we're, we're managing anyone that comes into our world appropriately at this point. Um, obviously, with the intent to, you know, continue to support collaboration and interoperability and greater engagement to support our population, um, whānau, et cetera. 
Thank you, Steve. So if there are no questions for, for comments, oh, kia ora, Muriel. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the report, Steve. My my question or comment is more around, is around the Zoom, uh, progress on the Zoom on page seven. And just sort of checking in, am I correct in understanding that that's more about enhancing um, um, clinical access, particularly for telehealth? Yeah, it's, it's further rollout of um, Zoom infrastructure to nominated areas that the business and the clinical community wish to have further capability deployed. That's what that's about, Muriel. So, uh, okay. yes, it's yes. No. Yep. <laughs> a long, yep. long, a long yes. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that that's good. Thank you, because it's great to see that progress. Because we don't want to lose that. Um, um, positive experience people had with telehealth during, you know, the first lockdown. So, you know, it's good to see that progress, but it's also great to see the progress overall. So thank you. Yeah, agreed. It, it, we, we do have um, the ability to see our usage on the Zoom platform. And uh, it's quite an interesting read because it's just gone up like a huge, big hockey stick. The amount of interactions occurring over Zoom now are just you know, phenomenal. Yeah, well, well that, hopefully that's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you, Muriel. Um, with that, I'd like to note the Digital Services Work Programme covering planned work for the 21-22 financial year. Note progress since the last reporting period and note the national and regional activity that may impact the planned work programme. I can have a mover, please. Kia ora, Muriel. And go on to second. All in favour, please. Thank you very much, Steve. And thank you also, I want to acknowledge the work that you're doing in the national, regional and national space as well. So um, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and enjoy the rest of your meeting. I'll, I'll see you a bit later on for a couple thank of Thank you, yes, we'll see you, we'll see you back again. See ya. And I'd like to welcome, welcome Jess Long. Uh, to, to our meeting for the next part, a non-financial monitoring framework and performance measures for quarter four, 2020-21. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, Chair. Um, and hello to everybody um, that's on the line today. Um, just like to present the paper for the quarter four um, DHB non-financial performance monitoring framework. Um, the exception report um, has highlighted eight uh, measures this quarter. Um, where we've got some actions um, and some activity planned to mitigate um, and uplift some of that performance. So I welcome any questions um, or any commentary on that one. Kia ora, Jess. Questions for Jess, observations. Kia ora, Matiroa. Kia ora, Morena. Um, Morena, Jess, thank you very much for the report. Um, I just... Yeah, I can see that there are some mitigations in place around the adolescent utilisation for dental. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because obviously I would suggest that that probably impacts quite severely on the Māori population, although the report doesn't actually specify that actually is probably a grow growing inequity. So it would be um, good at some point to have something that comes back to the board uh, saying what actually is that, how is that, because if the inequity is growing, how, how are our mitigations going to actually not only deal with the previous lot of inequity, but also stop it from growing a further gap. So I'd just like to have that noted as an action that we could have perhaps on the next lot of papers. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'll definitely include that for the next one. And just a note on that, the ministry are now monitoring that, uh, monitoring um, not so much the adolescent utilisation, but the enrolment, um, which obviously then has an impact on utilisation quarterly for this financial year, um, right. because I've obviously seen a decrease nationally um, as well as for our DHB. So yes, of definitely course. keeping a closer eye. Yeah, it is very concerning nationally. <laughs> And obviously, poor oral health leads to many other medical conditions. So it's a crucial one. Thank you. And I Thank just you. also wanted to note on page five, under help to quit smoking, um, the significance uh, 
where you note, it is pleasing to note that prevalence of smoking by Māori women has reduced to 20% from 36.5% compared to the previous quarter, which of course is actually a huge percentage move. And that, that is attributed to the work of um, Te Ohu Auahimutinga. So I'd like to really um, congratulate uh, the programs that have helped us as a DHB to achieve that significant move. So thank you for that. Like that noted. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Matiro. Uh, kia ora. We're, oh, you've just moved Heather on my on my screen, but I know you had your hand up. There you are. Um, hi, thank you very much for the report. I'm just interested in the colonoscopy wait time, and note that a um, a recovery plan ministry at the end of May. Um, where where so what does that mean? That includes um, access to Crest Hospital and uh, where are we at with now? Because delays on colonoscopy, particularly surveillance ones and even non-urgent ones, could be catastrophic for individuals. Yeah, unfortunately, I probably um, am probably not the right person to ask, but I can certainly follow up with the acute and elective team um, and get back to you on where we are post-May um, and if we've seen some improvement. So I can definitely feed that back um, for next quarter or sooner. Um, that would be good. Thank you very much. That's all right. <clears throat> Thank you, Heather. Kia ora, John. A moment of uh, mute button anxiety. I think there's a mistake in your report on page five under item 4.2.2, children fully immunised by the age of two. It reports in the last line that there's a fall in, from 83% to 69. I think the figure might be wrong following the 83% because that looks more like 70%. Okay, yep. I can certainly okay. um, double check that one. Thank you. I am on mute. Um, it's uh, the danger of trying to operate three different devices at the same time. Um, let me see, there's nobody else that has a question for Jess. It's Kath Oriana. Oh, kia ora Kath. Thank you, Chuck. Um, if Heather wants to go first, I'm, I'm happy to go. Sort of oh, Heather, Heather's. Oh, and you have to take a little hand down after you've finished your question. Thank oh, you. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, uh, one, I just, um, to talk to, not to say it's not an issue, but adolescent oral health was the one area where we actually had a positive equity um, perspective um, over time, where actually the results for us were better for Māori than non-Māori. That has started to deteriorate, though, so we, just, we do need to keep a close eye on it, but the equity gap, is not as significant as it is in other areas of the business. So we just need to be mindful of that. Um, we are back to business as usual in the colposcopy space. So we can um, report on where we're at um, with that piece of work. So now that we've moved to level two Delta um, and we're starting get, to get back to our, um, you know, to a more of a business as usual in our hospital space, that, that's helping. And the final thing, um, which was the first thing, but now is my final thing is I just, um, did want to acknowledge that this is Chiquita's last board meeting um, as the interim uh, general manager of strategy planning and performance. And um, I just thought it would be nice to acknowledge the um, significant support and effort um, that um, Chiquita has provided to the team and to the organization in that role. And um, that will pass to Deb Davies at the end of the week. Um, and Chiquita will be off to um, other new pastures. Thank you, Kath. And, and uh, I know the, the other board members will join me in endorsing your thanks to you, Chiquita. That's two huge roles that you've been carrying for some time now. And particularly in this uh, transition phase, um, that is a load of work. 
that you've been successfully carrying and moving through. So um, congratulations to Deb taking over, but also acknowledging your work. And we shall see you doing marvelous things in your next venture. And that will also be, you know, Shekha's obviously going to carry on with, with Think Her Water, but um, you're a bit of a superstar Wonder Woman, really, in terms of the, the, the places you go to and the things that you, you make happen in those places. So fortunate to have you. And thank you again, Kath, for, for raising it in this meeting. And thank you, Jess. It was nice to see you. This is um, no doubt we will see you again, but um, that was a, a fairly um, mild um, introduction to our to our boardroom. And, well, thank you. And so we look forward to seeing so, you in this space again. Thank you. So, Ori, I can see there's still hands. Oh, Jeff, sorry. Yeah. So, sorry, thank you, Chair. Just through you to John and to Jess. The issue of immunisation numbers, those percentages are correct. The numbers in brackets have just been switched around. So, right. that, ah. <laughs> so it, it is, it's not good news, it is a drop, but the numbers, the, bra the bracket should be switched over. Okay, perfect. A little bit of dyslexia, I think, there. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chief. Kia ora, Matiro. Oh, kia ora, Oriana. Sorry, mine wasn't about paper. So, I just, because I'm going to go in a moment, I just had one matter that I wanted to raise before I leave the meeting because you're going so swimmingly well I don't feel like I'll come back into part one <laughs> shall I do that now you may do it now yeah okay yeah. sorry so um firstly also just to acknowledge uh as you've said so eloquently both Kath and Oriana the contribution that Chiquita's made and also I think to acknowledge that Chiquita is going to go and spend time with the transitional health unit while also undertaking her role at Think Hawara. So that's great news for our district. So Namahi Kia I just wanted to raise, I know it's completely out of time with the agenda, but just for when you get there, on the board work plan, I understood that we had clearly said we wanted the transition plan into the new, whatever that looks like, into the new future to be on the board's uh, work program. And I noted that it's not, and um, I wanted to uh, put that in for some discussion when that item comes up, please, Oriana. I would like to see it because, as Oriana has also said, and as we said at our board to board meeting with Mana Whenua, they are embarking on uh, design next stages because the Mana Whenua Board does have a, a significant role in the new reform structure and we did say at the presentation that we want to support Mana Whenua. So as a board our way to support Mana Whenua is to make sure that at a governance level we have that on our radar and therefore we take opportunity to support where we can. So that was my, I'll, I'll leave that. I'm not expecting to turn it into that item now, but I just wanted to leave that for the discussion, please. Thank you for that. Thank you. Namahi. So I'd like us to, to, if there's no other comment or questions for Jess, I want us to note the summary report on stellar and progress made in delivering Mid-Central District Health Board's annual plan and performance expectations for the fourth quarter of 2020-21. Note the mitigations in place for those performance measures or deliverables that were not meeting expectations for quarter four, 2020-21. Do I have a mover? Kia ora Vaughan and kia ora Jenny. All those in favour, please raise your hand. And this is where I tried to skip to before. We're up to the schedule of commitments for 2021-22. And handing to you, Chick and Graham. Tēnā Graham, welcome. Good, Graham, you're on. Good, system works. 
Marina, uh, this, this uh, is around the schedule of commitments paper. Uh, the board's delegations policy requires the board to approve uh, the DHB's schedule of commitments. And this then gives delegation, uh, delegated officers the authority to sign contracts. Uh, the, this paper informs the board of the process for review and renewal of local contracts expiring on the 30th of September. It, uh, it presents to the board the new commissioning for outcomes framework that guides the process and relationships with, with providers, identifies a number of service lines subject to significant change and uh, seeks board approval for the DHB to enter into local contracts with providers as detailed in the schedule of commitments. FRAC endorsed the recommendations on the 7th of September. And this paper follows a paper in May that addressed national contracts expiring on the 30th of June. Uh, key points to note are that the Ministry of Health have requested that where possible DHPs enter uh, uh, contracts for a two year period. Uh, this is to reduce the burden on staff during the transition next year. Um, and contract variations are currently being prepared to provide extension of term and any price uplift agreed. And these are identified in Appendix 2. Over the next six months, we'll be working with the providers um, to uh, renew the uh, service review and renew where require the service specifications uh, into a standard format, which is provided uh, as Appendix 4. This is necessary to ensure that we transfer contracts um, which identify the uh, current services provided and are easily understood. Number of contracts with providers are dated with one going back to 2002. Over time, these have been varied uh, to extend terms, adjust prices or make changes to services. Um, some of the contracts have been renewed up to uh, 29 variations. And unless, um, each unless each variation um, is reviewed, it's difficult to understand what services are actually contracted by just looking at the last variation. In Appendix 1, we have provided the um, Commissioning for Outcomes framework, which will guide the conversations with providers. This... Um, Framework is, is, is uh, the foundation of the framework, uh, the quadruple aim and the final aura outcomes. And the process is guided by the principles of partnership, choice, sustainability, transparency, and continuous improvement. The um, key components or the key element of a, the commissioning approach is it, it takes an outcomes approach um, and a system and population health of focus working in partnership to co-design and commission services to improve collaboratively agreed outcomes. So it's really working in a relationship with providers um, rather than the traditional principal agent um, relationship. And it should also be noted um, that Piora have been using this approach um, for some time with establishing the relationships and working in partnership with providers. And finally, there are a number of service lines that uh, have been um, identified for disinvestment or significant change. And these are identified in Appendix 3. Kia ora, Graham. Thank you for that. Is, are there any questions or comments from board members? Kia ora, Karen. Oh, thanks, Oriana. Um, thank you for the report. Just um, a query on um, one of the um, contracts for significant change um, being YOS. And on page four, it's outlined that that will be commissioned directly from Tua Uru Pahara Keke. Um, so I'm just wanting to understand what impact that will have on their service provision. Is it just a simple transfer or is it actually a reduction? of service. Just a simple transfer, Karen. Okay. No reduction in service. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Is there any other 
comments from our board members? No. I just to say, Graham, that the you know, Think How Order and Tahi also have um, been long using the commissioning for outcomes um, model uh, for for quite some time. So so well used to. I think you described yesterday as it being a a relationship built on on trust between between partners as opposed to that master servant relationship that um, has in the past uh, been the model in terms of of contracting service providers. So we have yeah, providers in our in our DHB that are, are well used to to this way of working. Yeah, and I, I think there's increasing evidence that, that, that the traditional model is not very successful in social and health services. We have got a lot of uh, non-government organisations and not-for-profits. Yes, and, 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 and you will all know that, you know, the COVID situation last year and lockdown and, and, and this year as well, but not to the same extent that it was those providers that came to the fore in terms of reaching out to the communities that were most in need. And so why would you not trust them to deliver uh, services? So with that, if we've got no other questions, I want to, to thank you, Graham and Chiquita, for the report. And I want to, us to note the process for the review and renewal of contracts ending on 30th of September 2021. Note the new commissioning for outcomes framework. Note several contract service lines have been identified by directorates as requiring significant change. Note the Finance Risk and Audit Committee endorsed the DHB entering local contracts for two years with providers as detailed in the schedule of commitments at its meeting on 7th of September 2021. Approved the DHB entering local contracts for two years with providers as detailed in the schedule of commitments. Could I have a mover, please? Yes, Miriam. And a seconder. Uh, tēnā Heather. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. We are now on to uh, Kia ora, Sarah. Thank you. How are you? Kia ora. Lovely to see you all. Good to see you too. We're on, on midwifery workforce update. Thank you very much, Oriana. Um, through you, Chair, I'll take the paper as read. Um, some highlights from our previous report um, and for this reporting period. Obviously, we remain um, fully committed to active midwifery recruitment and retention. Um, I'm pleased to tell you that we have now had three um, new graduate applications um, to commence in the new year, which is absolutely fantastic, and that the clinical coach um, role we will be recruiting to in the next couple of weeks. So we expect that that person will be in place for the beginning um, of the new graduates coming into place. Um, there's been no progress on the nurse to midwifery transition program, to, program highlighted in the previous report, um, despite discussions with our ministry colleagues and um, Otago um, University. Um, we continue to approach that with the, with the provider at the moment. Also, AUT has not progressed with their course at the moment, which means it is looking like a 2023 commencement for that course. Um, midwifery professional supervision you'll see in the report has commenced and I think we've got about 18 staff that have showed interest and have commenced that that piece of work um, with Linny our, our professional supervisor which is fantastic and that's been really well received by the workforce. Um, we're progressing now with the senior midwifery leadership recruitment and we've um, been interviewing um, for the midwifery manager, previously known as the charge midwife, um, and we'll be progressing through the um, clinical midwife manager and the clinical midwife coordinator in due course. Um, the, f uh, the first Francis Health workshops took place week commencing the 20th of September um, and provided information about the um, uh, culture survey that we'd undertaken. So provided a real breakdown of that survey and looked for strategies that the team could work on to move forward. Um, happy to take any questions that we've got. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Observations, comments? Kia ora Vaughan. Thank you, Chair. Just in regards to the Director of Midwifery position, I know that the midwives, when they come with their delegation, wanted some input into the recruitment process and, or the selection process. Um, has that been able to be achieved, that engagement? 
Th thanks, Ronia. We had um, significant um, team involvement in the Director of Midwifery Recruitment at all levels, both core representation, um, NZ Com representation, Māori representation. Um, however, we didn't recruit to the post um, where the panel made the decision that, that we didn't have suitable candidates. Um, so we were, we're just working through that process at the moment around recruitment to that post moving forward. That's Thank fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments for Sarah? Just to note, Sarah, that I'm um, very pleased to hear about the recruitment of three new um, midwifery graduates. That's fantastic. And that is going to be the test in terms of, of everything that you've put in place in terms of supporting our midwifery workforce and their working environment. So um, very pleased to see that. and. And you'll be obviously very happy that that's that's occurring. I just got a question: Were, were in, are any of the Maori at all? Or um, no, I don't think so. I'm just shaking his head. Um, oh, no. okay. Of the three, no, but there um, is a potential fourth um, yeah. graduate, which um, who is Pacifica, um, and we're hoping that we can recruit her. I'll turn up yet. I know that's brilliant. But if there are no questions for, for Sarah, I... Heather's got a hand up. I don't know. That. Someone got a hand up? Heather. He yeah. Heather. Sorry, yeah. Heather. Oh, you have two. Brilliant. Um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering. So, thank you for the report. And obviously, there is a load of work going on. Um, and the um, survey and work as a result of that. How is morale generally? midwifery um yeah I, I think that's a, a really great question and um i think um you know we're having periods where um it's good and you actually feel like you're making really really good progress and then sometimes people um can't really see um progress and see an end in sight if that makes sense for recruitment um so it, um i think it's variable um, the workforce are hugely committed to, to um, good outcomes and making sure that we've got the right um, uh, place to work for staff. So, um, yeah, would, would you say that's true, Selena, from your perspective? Yeah, I, I, I would say that it is variable. Um, I'm in the unit every day. I go round and um, it does feel um, a lot better and a lot lighter. Yeah. Um, not as intense and um, stressed as we were six months ago. Well, here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this stuff is going to take a little while to um, uh, balance again. But thank you. Thank you for your efforts, um, both of you. Or right, and Jeff. <laughs> Uh, thank you through you chair um thank you sarah for the report a uh, huge amount of work going on and great to see progress particularly around the uh, new midwives um, my comment relates to the survey mentioned on page four and just wondering um, what format that survey takes because um, Jenny and I did a walk around in ward 23 the other day and they were telling us about their iPad survey that they do um, targeted surveys with patients um, while they're actually in the ward. And I wondered if that's actually what you do or whether it's more a, a written one that they feed back afterwards. Yeah, no, this is a specific, um, we've used something called Ask Your Team that we can continually pulse check and actually um, monitor our progress over the next 12 to 24 months. Um, and we've, we've specifically used this product so we can really build the culture questions because they were really focused on that specific area. Um, and we're happy to share. We'll, um, obviously, we've only just got this information back. And by when we wrote the report, we haven't got all the information, but we'll share some information with you in the next board report about the outcomes from that. So that so that's done while the women are in the facility. No, this is, is a staff. Sorry, this is a staff culture survey. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's staff. Yeah. Okay. Ah, yeah. uh, well, that 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 one though isn't that referring to um, with the uh, with this comment in the report refers to women. It says with two uh, women. Sorry, we've got we've got two. Sorry, we've got two surveys, Muriel. I've got very <laughs> confused there. So huge apologies. We've obviously got the staff survey that we're working yeah. on for culture, but we also have an iPad survey very similar to twenty three, where okay. we ask women for feedback. So huge apologies for that, Muriel. Yeah. 
Okay, so it is done with the woman while they're in the facility. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 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 So based on the numbers you're saying, there are only four responses. Do some women actually just prefer not to do it, or the staff don't have time to give them the opportunity? Um, could I respond yes, to that? Answer. Chair. Yes, Jeff. Ariana, if I can just respond, Muriel, the, there are some real issues with, with surveying um, outcomes for women and trying to link them to their care. Um, and there are some, as you are aware, privacy issues yeah. around de-identifying data. So on the one hand, an anonymous feedback survey gives free and frank um, expressions of the care they are just receiving or have received. And those numbers are reasonably low, which means that to try and actually do a proper survey of how did your care go, did you reach expectations, and to link that back to induction policies or um, the number of midwives around on the floor at the time is extremely difficult without um, having patient identity um, visible. So we yeah. are grappling yeah. with that dilemma at the moment. At the moment, the best we can do is to offer an anonymous survey, iPad based, and then go on the results of those who are prepared to give information. Absolutely, yeah, I totally, I totally get that. Um, thank you very much for your responses, Sarah and Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for your report. I'd like us to note the current midwifery workforce position. Note the key updates to the midwifery action plan and could I have a mover for that please? I see Muriel smiling and Karen. Thank you. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Kia ora. And welcome Selena. Thank you. I think Jenny had a question. I noticed oh, Jenny you? had a hand up. Oh, sorry, Jenny. Paper. I don't know if you want to take that or move on. Thank Jenny. you, Selena. Sorry, Jenny. You're on mute. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, well, yeah, I wasn't. But um, thank you, Selena. And we have moved on and, and now it's been moved. But I guess just following on from Muriel's point is around because she raised the four. Four is really concerning because four is not allowing us to hear the woman's voice, is it? So um, I guess a... Um, and I think it reported for, but I'm not sure I read what actual the action was um, in regards to trying to increase that. So I think it spoke about the consumer liaison and I don't know whether being away or being working on other things. But um, I think the question that wasn't asked for Muriel was that she asked two questions. Is it that the woman um, wanting to complete it or is it that because of, and that would be understandable, because of the busyness um, on the ward, that the staff aren't, it's not seen as a priority to give it to women. So I think for us to understand that as governors, and also to, to I guess, you know, clearly there's some concern of that missing element of the woman's voice then. Actually, Jenny, I think what's happened is we've got um, um, somebody's left from that unit who did that for us. So we had um, a, an administration member of staff that went around independently and gave that. And she's actually left the um, DHB. And actually, the person in there at the moment is temporary. So she's not picked that up. And I think we've just had a bit of a gap in relation to that at the moment. Um, and I know Harpa is focusing really strongly on trying to improve that in the coming months. But, um, but I think that's why our numbers have significantly dropped off in the last um, two to three months. Cool. Very useful insight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Selena. You're welcome. Um, shall I continue? Yes, you may. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Through you, I will take the paper as read. Um, as you're aware, the report uh, reflects uh, the last part of winter. Um, the acuity was still high in August, and uh, we moved obviously into resurgence of our COVID de Delta variant. Um, our consultant nurse, um, Helen Manaharan, is starting work very closely with all our senior uh, nursing and midwifery team to ensure really good recruitment um, in those vacancies that we have got coming through from CCDM um, and natural um, attrition. Um, again, uh, the core data set shows um, how difficult it is for our nursing teams um, on certain shifts. Um, but it was lovely to see, uh, the, the, as previously reported by Tracy, that uh, uh, Bonnie was recognised for her outstanding uh, service to nursing. Um, and I have to say, I'm very proud um, of our nursing teams, of her and our whole nursing teams, who strive each day uh, to give excellent nursing care to our patients, um, particularly in these difficult times. Any questions? 
Thank you for that, Selena. And just to, to support and endorse your comments in terms of your, your nursing team. And yes, Bonnie's recognition is um, really pleasing to see and particularly um, a morale booster in terms of, of not only the nursing uh, sector as a whole, but particularly in terms of, of, of Māori nursing. So mm -hmm. on that, um, I'd open it up to anyone who has a comment or a question on the report for Selena at all. Kia ora, Karen. Um, thanks, thanks, Selena, for the report. Um, and I, it is really um, useful. In particular, the dashboard um, in Appendix 2 is um, something that I think is really important for us to track, um, mm. particularly the hospital shifts below target the trend, which I do think is concerning the fact that it is on its way up. And I'm really keen, I'm really hopeful that we can see that come down in the future. Um, what are the strategy, you know, is it just about recruitment or are there other strategies to try and bring that down? Um, it's but it, it, um, let's be very clear that not every shift below target is an unsafe shift. Um, and I think we need to make sure that, that we are all understanding of that. Um, but the shifts below target are IOC, our integrated ops centre. They work really well uh, together, looking at the VRMs and moving staff around flexibly to ensure that those, that, that, that those nurses are working within a, a, a safe environment. We do have um, a, a clinical duty nurse manager, and she will attend immediately once the VRM moves to a yellow or an orange and ensure that she works very closely with that team to make sure that shift is, is a good shift. Um, so just following on from that, just to, to clarify, what is recorded as a shift below target, is that before or after any mitigation is put in place? Uh, usually before, yeah. So how, how would we as governors um, be able to measure because I'm aware that sometimes there aren't staff available to put you know to fill the gaps so mm -hmm. once the mitigation is put in place if people are transferred where would we get an understanding of the subsequent gaps uh, that aren't met following mitigation or shifts so this is shift below target so how would we get an understanding of how many shifts remain unfilled or below target after those mitigations? Those would be place. from our the VRM status reports and also from our, our IOC and the duty nurse manager reports that we have on shift by shift. So as governors, we, what would we be looking at on this report to have an indication of that? Uh, you wouldn't see that because, um, and I can have a look at that and get our IOC to report on that if you want to, but that's that's really down into the detail. Um, I think from my perspective as a governor, that is probably the more important issue is the gap that is left after mitigation is put in place. I mean, I think both is important, but more importantly, I'd be interested to know, I mean, if 30% is very high um, and I'm, I'm pleased to hear that there is, um, you know, obviously at least some shifts that are that 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 is addressed, but without knowing how many shifts it's not addressing, I guess that doesn't give us any sort of awareness of of the sort of gap that actually exists. Um, that whether that might be a risk in terms of care. I'm not sure if there's a simple way to address that, but yeah, I, I think that is important for us to be aware of. I, I will find a way to um, uh, to allow you to see that uh, for the next report. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Kia ora, Jenny. Kia ora. Um, and I, I just have a couple of questions. Thank you, Selena. So just bear with me as I'm trying to navigate the Zoom and also my um, questions. Um, which I've noted. So my first one, oh, my first one's just a clarification, please. On page nine, um, it has around incidents, there's 254 incidents, which states it's a 15% increase. But earlier in the report, in the narrative, it says it was a decrease on last month. So just trying to understand if our incidents have gone up by 15% or, or not. Yeah, so one... Have I misinterpreted that or is the diagram contradicting the narrative or vice versa? 
I think there's, yeah, there's probably, um, I think it was um, a increase. Um, so yeah. I will okay, so it was, that, an, yeah. yeah, there was an increase. Okay. In Just because 15 percent is fair, so I think it's as again as Gavin is good to understand yeah, yeah. if, if a, a, a decrease should be celebrated, right? But just yeah, yeah wondering absolutely. if it's an increase or decrease. Thank you. Um, my next one is on, and, and you know, I appreciate there could be um, after you know Karen's point too, there could be unlimited. Um, detail that, that you could send and you're trying not to do this but I guess I did have a point on page 11 around the staff unplanned leave trending and I think Kay is doing a, a project on, on looking at this as well which I'm very interested in but mm -hmm. um, you know I think I've asked this before I would find it interesting to to see what this looked like per staff or department I'm trying to think potentially there's a report that comes out is that maybe Kay's report do we every so often see that whether it's once a year but um, even if there was a narrative towards you know we're seeing seeing a, a particular trend in this department or yeah I would be interested in that I don't know okay. if by memory or by note Selena you you're aware of a particular trend or concern or uh, change no um that's usually covered off in in the workforce report that KO does for yeah. HR um I yeah. do see the, the the leave over two years um, obviously, district nursing has been an area that of, of great concern, but um, yeah, we've been working very hard to, to address that in each area. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so that was the unplanned leave. But then on page 12, um, in terms of the excess leave. Oh, sorry, leave, that was the unplanned leave. Yeah, um, yeah the unplanned leave um, it tends to be in our high acute areas, which is obviously in ED, um, and also on our main medical and our main surgical floors, because they're just so busy. ED, yeah, is a, is, ED has been a problem has been a problem okay and I guess that's why I was a little bit interested in by department only because I guess I was trying to do a little bit of um, analysis and trying to understand it because then the excess leave accrued is by department which is really useful um, so you know it would be interesting if we're if we're not managing to get out and accommodate their um, planned leave but as a result people are ending up taking unplanned leave anyway so we're still without the staff and yeah so you know I don't know I'm drawing an assumption there but I do think that would be useful to see um, and and then in regards to page 12, then, you know, I, I of course couldn't help but note our department that has the highest excess leave by what it's looking at here um, is maternity, which we know, of course, you know, we, we know the reason that we're probably not able to approve that leave. But, you know, when we also talk about the stress they're under, the challenge to retain them, you know, all those things, it's such a fine line isn't it because are we not able to support their leave but then they end up you know moving on you know it's a bit of a one in one out system at the moment isn't it so yeah I don't know what the answer is but yeah when I see that I definitely some thoughts come to mind yeah and that is just work in progress to make sure we get the white the work-life balance ready you know for every member yeah. of staff um, it's just keep working at it yeah yeah Thank you, Jenny. Kia ora, Vaughan. Uh, kia ora, thank you, Chair. Uh, kind of prompted out of uh, Karen's question around the CCDM around just because they're below target was the response that it doesn't correspond that they're not an unsafe sh shift. Yeah. I, I wanted to just kind of press down a little bit on that just in regards to when is it flagged that it's an unsafe sh shift? What, what is what is the flag for us to say, oh, we've had five unsafe shifts this quarter? How, how, what, what can we interpret as being that parallel, if there's any? So usually if, if the nursing team are not feeling uh, that they're, they're feeling uncomfortable, it's usually that uh, one, it, it's an, a number of data that we would look at. So that's the shift below target. It would be their VRM. Um, so their variance response, were they in green or were they in yellow or were they in orange? Then you would also see whether or not they put in a risk man to say that they felt unsure and unsafe um, on that particular shift. There is that, as I said to you, there is that professional judgment where the, the you know, the senior nurse um, of the area, along with the duty nurse manager, will make that and they will then pull in the aid on as well, uh, the associate director of nursing to, to look at that from a professional basis as well. 
So it's a number of things that would, would determine whether or not a shift is unsafe. Okay. And is it any of those things corresponded to say you have been in the in the wrong zone for the VRM and, and risk man reports coming through? Has there been any in the last quarter risk man reports? We do see those risk man reports um, and you see those at FRAC. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that's the mechanism. I just want to understand well. the they mechanism. Yeah, what the flags. The incidents. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Vaughan. Thank you, Selena. If there's no further questions for Selena, I'd like us to note the nursing workforce reporting. Could I have someone move, please? Kia ora, Lou, and a second. Thank you, Karen. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Selena. And um, I just want to commend you on your work in a very challenging space that it continues to be. So, so thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome Judith back. Kia ora. Kia ora, um, Judith. Uh, thanks for um, bringing me back into the Zoom room. Um, Margaret and I have collaborated on this paper, which um, came from your last board meeting where you were concerned around the payments um, being offered to our consumer council members. So we hope this paper outlines um, how we currently remunerate our council members. It actually covers both our consumer and our clinical council. Um, we um, look to be as consistent as we can in that space. Um, and it also covers off the um, additional payments that our consumer um, representatives receive if they're involved in um, committees, steering groups, et cetera, outside of the Consumer Council, which is covered by our consumer um, engagement and payment policy. Um, it outlines that um, we are certainly within um, the normal range in terms of the um, payments that we pay. In fact, we're at the top end of the range that we would be expected to pay under the Public Services Commission guidance. Um, and we also benchmark pretty favourably with other DHBs um, in terms of how payments are, are made. Um, that, that's in both of the um, consumer council area and also in the way we remunerate consumers as representatives. So I hope it helps to clarify the, um, the concern that you raised. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm sure, I'm sure Kath would as well um, if there were any particular issues. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Judith. Are there any questions for, for Judith? And thank you for the clarification in terms of the um, State Services Commission and, and the role that they play in actually setting fees, which doesn't leave a lot of room. And I'm also glad to see that we are towards the top end in terms of what is allowed in that framework in terms of payments to both our consumer and clinical council members. So on that, do we have questions, comments from anyone? So thank you, Judith and Margaret for the paper. Um, I'd like to note the cabinet fees framework requirements for payments to members of Mid Central District Health Board, Consumer and Clinical Council. And I'll move that from the chair. And if I can have a second to thank you, Karen. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. I'll leave and come back in the second. Thank part. you, and we'll see you. We we'll see you shortly again. <laughs> we don't have any late items, and our date of our next meeting is Tuesday, the 9th. Actually, I think I've missed something. I have missed board our works board program. work program. And I'd like us to note the board's annual work program. If I can have a mover for that, please. Thank oh, you, Chair, I was Thank just wondering very... about picking up the point that Matero raised before she left. Uh, yes, um, we're going to pick that, um, that up in our CEO and board um, discussion in part three, but that has been noted and we will, and, and that's not, um, around any, any you know, exclusion of, of public or any privacy reasons. It's just an opportunity for the CEO to, to um, 
discuss with the board and for the board to be open and frank around any questions around the transition. But um, basically, we can't have a plan um, without getting direction from, from central government in terms of where to next. And although, as we've heard, there's, there's lots of movement. And in saying that, I, want, I would also direct people to the new website that has been established that anyone can, can go to in terms of updating them on the, um, the work of the transition unit. Someone, Chiquita Keith will know the name of it. It escapes my mind at the moment. But it's called oh, Future, Future of Health is the name of the, of the website that um, you can go to. But in saying that... Sorry, could I just interrupt? Um, Certainly. At the FRAC meeting, it was agreed to add the transition plan to their work program. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. But we will also be discussing that. Heather. Hi, thank you. Um, just on the work program, I note somewhere else, as I noted, um, you know, we've heard from midwifery workforce, we've heard from nursing, we've heard from um, the medical workforce. I, I'm not sure we've heard from Allied Health, and I don't see it on our work program, and I'm wondering when that might be. I don't know whether that will spill over into 2022, but um, I would be interested to know when that's scheduled. Um, so they would definitely be expected to be um, a further group. So I don't think we differentiate um, um, uh, in the report, the groups and the dates. Do I'm just trying to find the bit that has that. It, it it's on page five, midway yeah. down in the green. Yeah, professional work group. So you're quite right. The next one would be um, be uh, Allied Health in December. EDAH it says on the on the on the work program. Okay. All right. Thank you. So Gabriel will be working with her team on that one. Thank you. Kia ora, Karen. Oh, thank you. And just also on page five, um, I see um, scheduled for November is the annual board evaluation. And I just wondered what sort of format that will be um, following. Like, as, I mean, in the past, we've sometimes had a survey. I don't know. I mean, we've only got nine months to go. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I just wondered if there's any thought given to how, what sort of format that will be. Might be easier to leave that one for Brendan. Brendan, yeah, true. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. And I just want to to cover off. We've got uh, towards the iwi partnerships, and people will know that the memorandum of understanding is up for up for renewal, and that is not going to happen given that we are moving to a new entity. Uh, as at the 1st of July, but certainly Mana Whenua Hauora will be coming back to the board with um, their plan going forward in terms of, of uh, not only how Mana Whenua Hauora will look into the future, but also what, once we know um, how things are going to progress, what that relationship will look like going into the future. So that um, is why it's not on um, today's agenda. Is there anything else anyone wants to raise with the work plan? If not, I want us to note the board's annual work plan and I'll move that if I can have a second to please. Yeah, Thank Muriel. you, Muriel. And all in favour, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. And now... We have no late items. The date of our next meeting is Tuesday, the 9th of November, 2021. And all going well, we will all be face-to-face -face in the boardroom. Um, I'd now like to move to 10, which is the exclusion of the public. The recommendation is that the public be excluded from this meeting in accordance with the Official Information Act 1992, section nine for the following items for the reasons stated. If I can have a mover, please. Thank you, Vaughan. 
And thank you, Muriel. And all those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. And we are going to, um, aren't we Margaret? We're moving out of this Zoom once it closes, having a short break. And we will have a 10 minute break and come back at, um, at 10.40. Is that, Margaret, I know you're still on. Um, yeah, that will work. So that will work for us. Thank you very much. So thank you uh, for joining us and we shall see you run in 10 minutes.